Good morning and welcome to the 31st meeting of the Criminal Justice Committee in 2024. We have no apologies this morning and our first agenda item is for the committee to decide whether to take item six in private. Are we all agreed? Thank you very much. So our first main item of business today is an oral evidence taking session on an affirmative and a negative instrument. And they are the Coronavirus Recovery and Reform Scotland Act 2022, Extension of Temporary Justice Measures Regulations of 2024, and the COVID Recovery and Reform Scotland Act 2022, Early Expiry of Provisions Regulations of 2024. So we're joined this morning by the Cabinet Secretary for Justice and Home Affairs and I also welcome to the meeting Patrick Down of the Criminal Justice Division, Valaf Khalifa Krishnan of the Criminal Justice Dis Division and Nicola Guild, Scottish Government Legal Directorate. So I refer members to papers one to three and I intend to allow up to 30 minutes for this evidence session. So, can I start by inviting the Cabinet Secretary to make some opening remarks on the SSI's Cabinet Secretary? Good morning, Convener. As the Committee knows, the Coronavirus Recovery and Reform Scotland Act 2022 includes a, a range of temporary justice measures. They were introduced to make sure our justice system had the necessary flexibility to respond to the impact of the pandemic. Since then, justice agencies have made significant progress towards recovery and the need for some of the temporary measures has disappeared or reduced. Last year, the Scottish Government made regulations that expired several measures. Our continuing determination to reduce the number of temporary measures is shown by the expiry regulations the committee is considering today, which expire two more because they are no longer deemed necessary or proportionate. And that includes one of the extended time limits that were put in place at the start of the, the pandemic. The extension regulations proposed would extend the remaining temporary measures so that they stay in force until the end of 30th November 2025. My decisions on which measures to extend have been based on consultation with justice agencies, the legal profession, the judiciary, uh, local government, victim support organisations and other third sector bodies. The statement of reasons which I laid alongside the regulation sets out the findings um, of that consultation and review in some detail. For now, I will briefly outline why I believe we need to retain these provisions. We are still seeing the impact of the pandemic on criminal court backlogs. Considerable progress has been made to reduce the backlog. The total number of outstanding scheduled trials fell by over 40% uh, between January 2022 and August uh, 2024. However, modelling by the Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service predicts that solemn backlogs will persist above the target baseline until 26-27. The measures in the extension regulation continue to help ensure court resources are effectively used. For example, the availability of higher maximum fines means more summary cases can be diverted from prosecution, reducing the number of cases that need to go to court. And the two extended time limits, uh, which the extension regulations would continue for one final year before they revert to their pre-pandemic level. These increase the court's capacity to hear trials uh, rather than spend time on procedural matters. That helps the throughput of cases and protects victims' access to, to justice. I am committed to the time limits reverting next year. Indeed, there is no ability to extend them any further uh, under the 2022 Act, and ministers have no intention of legislating to make them permanent. So the extended time limits will end uh, no later than 30th November 2025. However, justice agencies are clear that these extended time limits continue to play 
an important role in helping the courts manage the current solemn caseload. The data I offered shows the progress made so far, uh, but we should allow justice agencies con to continue their work in reducing the backlog. Without these provisions, their view is that the time scale for reducing uh, the solemn case backlog would be extended. Uh, there would also be a risk that some cases would not uh, proceed at all. And I'm sure that none of us want to jeopardise the court's capacity to focus on the, the throughput of trials. It is plain to me that the two remaining extended time limits it must be continued for one final year, after which they will expire. The other measures in the extension regulations include conduct of business by electronic means, attending a court by electronic means and national jurisdiction for callings from custody. While the pandemic was a catalyst for introducing them, they have shown their value in helping uh, modernise our justice processes and make them more efficient. This is delivering better outcomes and experiences for people using Scotland's justice services. It is right that we look to extend the use of these valuable measures, which will promote the ongoing recovery of the justice system and ensure modernised practices that were much needed and welcomed can continue. Permanent reform requires primary legislation. Last month, we introduced the Criminal Justice Modernisation and Abuse of Domestic Behaviour Reviews Scotland Bill, which proposes making permanent those measures that have proved of broader and longer term benefit. So to be clear, convener, the bill does not make any provision to continue extended time limits. As I've said, those cannot be retained beyond the end of November 2025. And I believe when looking at the extension regulations collectively as a package of temporary measures, it is clear that they are vital in helping to support our justice system's continued recovery and resilience in the coming year. So thank you, convener. Okay, thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. So I'm now going to open up to questions from members and I'll bring in Russell Finlay. Thank you very much, Convener. Um, there are a couple of issues that we raised this time last year which still are of concern. The first one relates to the increase of fiscal fines from £300 to £500. Now, this time last year, the Cabinet Secretary asked for a one-year extension. We objected, we put it to a vote, Labour supported it, but nonetheless, the Government got its way. And here we are again, seeking another one-year extension to what was supposed to be a temporary power only necessary due to the pandemic. Um, now, when we raised this last year, the Cabinet Secretary told the committee that there would be a public consultation which published its findings in July, and some respondents raised concerns specifically about the increased use of fiscal fines. Um, one respondent said, and I quote, that it would negatively affect the ability of the criminal justice system to deliver its public protection function. And another respondent expressed concerns that these fines were being used for more serious offences that would normally be prosecuted in a court. And that's been borne out by recent reports in which a number of serious crimes, including assault, are being dealt with by way of fiscal fines. So there's no trial, there's no conviction, and often the victims are not informed of the outcome. So I'd really like to ask the Cabinet Secretary if she genuinely thinks this is appropriate, this further extension is appropriate, given these misgivings about the use of fiscal fines. Um, thank you, Convener, and thanks to, to Mr Finlay. I mean, I know he has um, you know, long-term objections and views um, on fiscal fines. Um, as committee will be aware, fiscal fines have been part of our justice system for decades. And just to be clear, the specific uh, measures that we are talking about is um, having a new level of fiscal fine. Instead of the maximum being £300, um, there is an additional uh, level of fine up to um, £500. Um, and what the statistics show that in terms of uh, fiscal fines that have been applied, um, that only 2% um, of fiscal fines have been used in that um, up to £500 fine. Um, just for, for the record, um, in terms of the trajectory over the long term, um, 
convener, the, the use of um, fiscal fines has actually fallen. It's fallen quite um, significantly. So um, in terms of 2018-19, um, it was 21,678 uh, fiscal fines um, were um, initially issued. Um, the 2023-24 figures um, is 12,108, and I'm happy to share those figures um, with committee um, in full. Now, what this means is that if there wasn't the facility for prosecutors to... You know, look at a case and think, well, £300 maximum fine is not appropriate in this instance, but actually, you know, up to £500 is. Um, you would therefore have, you know, two, two to 300 more cases going through the, 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 the JP courts. So um, I do think it is um, necessary uh, to retain these measures. It is an extension of the uh, maximum fine limit. I think it's pragmatic and um, if I can say to Mr Finlay that there are good common sense reasons um, for, for, for keeping keeping this provision another year in terms of the extension uh, but also you know, building it in uh, to the Criminal Justice Modernisation Bill as I've already set out to, to Parliament with the introduction of that legislation. It was just in terms of the statistics, I'm sure we would like to see those. It's interesting to see that fiscal fines appear to have significantly reduced, but I think they should be seen in the wider context of all direct measures. So I think if we're being provided with those figures, that should also include recorded police warnings, antisocial behaviour, fixed penalty notices, and any other such measures, because it may well be that some of these have reduced, but others have increased. Um, now, last year, um, I suggested that the government, if they wanted to extend this, should bring forward primary legislation. The Cabinet Secretary today said that she doesn't intend to extend this, I believe. Is that correct? No. As, after this one year? No. I, I'm, I'm, forgive me, convener. I thought it was crystal clear. Um, the um, statutory instruments will extend for one year. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but having the ability to issue a fiscal fine up to £500 will be part of oh. uh, the primary legislation, the Criminal Justice Modernisation um, Bill. So we right. have actually included that okay. in our future uh, plans Thank for you. primary Thank legislation. You. That bill was published, um, or was introduced to Parliament, um, it was either last week or the week before. Great. Thank you. The other issue that was of concern relates to the, ex the, the power of the Crown Office have been given um, to extend how long they have to put someone on trial. Now, previously it was 80 days from the service of an indictment in a, in a solemn case, which of course are the more serious cases. Um, that was increased by way of these temporary COVID measures to 320 days for, for those who are not in remand and 260 days for those who are held in remand, which is a huge increase and as we know, supposedly a temporary increase, but this is now going to run if this is passed today until 2025. Um, I just wonder if the Cabinet Secretary agrees that these extensions, keeping people in remand for so much longer, is only adding to the crisis in the prisons, which are dangerously overcrowded already. So um, I would hope Mr Finlay and committee would um, realise and appreciate that there is uh, nothing I take more seriously than the situation currently faced uh, within our penal establishments. And if I you know, can say to committee that if I thought that removing uh, these time limits um, this year as opposed to next year would help, um, that would be what I would be proposing. Um, my concern um, is that if we remove um, the two remaining um, time limits or the two time limits that I'm proposing are extended for one year only, um, that that will actually add to the problem um, of remand as opposed to um, alleviate it. Because what will happen is that if we remove it right now, is that instead of um, focusing on the throughput of criminal justice cases, 
what will happen is that on a case-by-case -case basis, decisions will be made to extend the time limits. And it's always been, the, the system's always had the ability to extend time limits on a case-by-case -case basis. Now, if they are doing that for a substantial number of cases, that will therefore only add um, to, 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 to delay. Um, so I'm proposing that um, we give the system one more year to transition. I'm not making, I'm not making yeah. permanent in primary legislation uh, these temporary COVID um, time limits. Um, okay. We five of those time limits, well, four have now expired. I'm proposing to expire um, another one. And I suppose the, to cut to the chase that, um, you know, the increase in remand is affected by the backlog um, and extending the time limits um, is a result of the backlog. So to reduce remand, uh, we also have, we have to reduce the backlog. Thank you. I mean, I just wonder, final question, I just wonder if you or your officials happen to have any data on how often these extensions have been used since yeah. these temporary measures were introduced? Uh, we will have, we will have. Pa Patrick, could you um, speak to that, please? I, will, I think we would have to come back in writing on that. I'm not sure that we have statistics specifically on the number of extensions that are granted on a case-by-case -case basis um, would be something that we'd have to speak to the Crown Office about. Right, OK. Thank you. Thank you. Um, OK, thank you. I'll bring in Pauline McNeill and then Sharon Dowie. Thank you very much. Um, good morning. Um, can I start with the use of fiscal fines? So um, that's interesting to note that the use of fiscal fines has fallen. Um, mm. Is there any information on the levels of fiscal fines that have been used? I mean, how often would the full maximum fines have been used in, in the pandemic period that would, that would demand a, an increase up to 500 or to maintain that? So, um, as, as I say to Mr Finlay, um, the, the information um, that I have been cited on is that the um, the, 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 the new level of, you know, over three hundred up to um, five hundred pounds um, fiscal fine um, has been used in um, around two percent of cases. So it's a very small proportion um, overall, um, but two percent of you know twelve thousand um, cases. It's been used in two percent of cases. Yep. Yeah, yes. But, but you know, is there any information on the how often the maximum was used or I mean the, the reason for asking mm -hmm. is it is still quite a significant um, jump from 300 to 500 which has been in place but you're asking the committee to consider supporting the next, remaining the extension in place yeah I mean I do, I mean I, I'm asking mm -hmm. committee uh, to um, support um, the extension for it to remain in place I would like to that for it to remain in place permanently, hence why it's part of our uh, legislation that we've um, introduced uh, to Parliament, the, the, the primary legislation. I don't have granular mm. information about right. how many on £450 okay. or £500. I, I presume um, that when you lay the, the new bill, that you, 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 will, you will let the committee see some detail around its use and what offences it's been used for. So, I mean, that's the problem, is that we've been asked to yeah, really accept something in, in the dark because we don't really know how well, it's used. Yeah. So, I mean, my understanding <clears> was <throat> that the Crown Office uh, was updating a uh, committee regularly on this matter, uh, that at last updated committee, I am told, um, and I can mm -hmm. I'll stand to be corrected by members, um, earlier this year, and that another update um, is imminent in, in October. Okay. Well, okay, I, I, I take Ms McNeill's point, convener, um, and um, we will um, relay that request to the Crown Office that committee is looking for more granular information. Mm. Okay, See, we, we do receive regular updates on a range of things. Some of them are shared by email, some of them are, are, are in our weekly bulletin. So, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm comfortable that that information will have been shared with us. Um, back to you, Pauline. Thank you very much. Um, 
So it looks like there's some progress being made in relation to ple the depleting diet. Um, so just based on using the calculator here, four to three weeks um, is 301 days. So that, so the current legal limit without that is 110 days. So is it fair to say that these time limits that you want to be extended quite significantly, I mean, how confident are you if we extend the limits that progress will continue to be made? Yeah, given that, as you know, Cabinet Secretary, before the pandemic, they were not meeting the time limits <clears throat> by quite a long way. Well, if I can uh, reassure um, Ms. Ms. McNeill that I can't be any clearer that um, extending the uh, remaining two uh, COVID time limits for the SORN cases is not uh, in our criminal justice uh, modernisation bill. Um, and I have been crystal mm -hmm. clear with Parliament, I hope, um, and also justice stakeholders um, with regards uh, to um, this, this matter. Um, this final uh, year um, of extension that I'm proposing is essentially to enable a, an effective transition um, and a smooth transition. Um, we see that progress is being made um, and I wish that progress uh, to continue and I will continue to support um, that progress um, over the piece. Um, the government to date has um, invested £180 million um, in, in recovery. That is a significant amount um, of, of resource. Um, and I am um, accepting um, of the various justice agencies and their plea for this to extend uh, for one last year to assist in the good planning and the transition, because this is not uh, in my plans for primary legislation. Thank you. I do welcome that. But as you know, we shared the concerns of uh, Russell Finlay, the passage of this, about the impact on remand in particular. And I know you can't answer this, but I mean, I question quite closely the Crown's continual pushing for the indictment process to be 180 days, and I still don't have an answer as to why it would be necessary. I understand that setting a pleading die is more difficult. However, I know you can't answer that. Um, just lastly, on the national jurisdiction, so you wish that to remain in place under the SSI before us. Uh, again, it was just to say, I mean, the, the principle of Scots law has always been part of the pandemic that you would be tried where the crime was committed in that particular sheriffdom. And some reasons for that is that local sheriffs or sheriffs that serve in that sheriff know the area and also for the accused and people attending court, it kind of makes sense. Is the problem with national jurisdiction not that, that someone who, who's in the Sheridan of Glasgow, I can't remember its full title, forgive me, um, could end up in Aberdeen? And I know you intend to make this a permanent measure, but it's, it's one that gives me some cause for concern. And again, the committee have got no information on where people are being tried, using this provision, which I think we accepted during the pandemic was a necessary, um, proportionate measure. Um, but I, I do question that one as well. So, I mean, the national jurisdiction, national jurisdictions for um, uh, calls from custody, um, it's, it's not a provision that's used to the maximum. Um, my view is that it allows for flexibility, um, bearing in mind that you know public health emergencies have been a factor in our, our recent history, uh, and uh, weather uh, in the small and climate uh, country. Uh, so I think there are pragmatic arguments to retain um, the flexibility. Um, I do um, recall last year, um, Miss Clark. Um, asking that if after the initial um, custody hearing, um, you know, would further hearings, um, could they be held anywhere? And that's, you know, not the case because we're very cognizant of the fact that you don't want vic 
witnesses mm -hmm. having to travel um, all over the, the, the country. So it is, it is a, a limited provision, and I think there are pragmatic reasons for keeping it because it allows uh, for uh, fle flex flexibility. Thank you. Thank you. And Sharon Dowie. Thank you. Can I just go back and ask another question on prisoners in remand? Um, I've heard before about concerns about prisoners that are put in remand don't get the same access to services or rehabilitation when they're in the prison as somebody who's actually serving a sentence. Mm. Is that something that's been looked at when we're extending the time that they'll be held in remand? So it's not, it's not directly related to the um, very specific, quite technical provisions in, in front of us uh, today. Um, but the... Um, broader point is that people on remand are held on a different legal basis from um, convicted uh, prisoners so there are you know expectations uh, on uh, you know participation um, in particular activities for sentenced prisoners whereas people on remand um, are you know innocent till proven um, otherwise um, and while the prison service will do a lot to encourage people to, you know, participate in, in purposeful um, activity, um, th th there is just a different um, le le legal legal basis. So it's, it's not been. I'm just trying to think that if, if somebody ends up going into prison and they're in for a substantial amount of time, but they're not getting any rehabilitation while they're in, or attending any courses or, or anything to give them skills when they come it's, back into the community? Is there so, any...? So, can I... So, right. you, for someone who has not been convicted of an offence, mm -hmm. if they're held on remand um, and are, you know, will be um, pleading and arguing their innocence, um, that is not the environment to do offending behaviour work. Um, and, indeed, they would be... Um, advised against any um, admissions um, because when people participate in offending behaviour work for example um, much of that work um, is on the basis that you know, this is what the court court of law has decided uh, that the person is guilty of um, and therefore part of the work, particularly the preliminary work um, is for people to um, own their actions and to be able to talk in detail about the offence uh, that they have committed. That is really difficult with remand prisoners, um, particularly because you know they are innocent until proven otherwise. It's a completely different uh, legal basis. There is a, there are arguments, however, for um, it's important that other support for other needs that are non-offence based. So in terms of um, for remand prisoners, you know, in terms of their health care needs, uh, the they absolutely uh, should be attended to on the same basis as any other prisoner. So are, are there any instances where somebody would actually be held in remand and by the time they actually go to court, they've already served their sentence? Yes. Right, so that means that while they were in and if they've been found guilty and they've already served their sentence, they've had no rehabilitation courses or anything that they're in, so they then get released straight away, which then means that the likelihood is, if they've not received rehabilitation, that they could yeah. just go straight back out and offend again. And that's why one of the range of actions we have to take to address the length of time people are spending on remand, one of those actions is to reduce the backlogs. So we need so reducing the court backlogs uh, will benefit uh, the remand population because it will make a, a significant contribution to reducing the time people spend on remand. Okay. And one last question. In your submission, you'd said that the Scottish Government had consulted with justice partners, legal profession, victim organisations and third sector organisations and that there was strong support in retaining such measures. Were there any objections to the extension of the measures and is there anything that would be helpful to the committee to know? So I don't, I don't, I don't recall there being any um, strong objections to measures um, and that's all narrated in the, the, the statement for reasons that I have submitted. Um, understandably, um, some stakeholders will raise issue about um, um, you know, digital access 
Um, so that's why the um, Scottish uh, Courts and Tribunal system, um, we're not, we're not, um, we don't want to see a wholesale uh, return to the use of paper. Um, but, you know, people can access um, documents and can use physical documents. It's why the Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service, for example, are working with the Citizens Advice Scotland um, and have a, a, a strategy to support digital um, inclusion. Okay. okay, thank you. One very, very final... Yeah. Mm -hmm. it's just, when you asked the committee last year for a one-year extension, at that point, did you tell the criminal justice agencies that they had one year to sort themselves out, or did you intend to come back here again this year to ask for one more year? So, the, the, the legislation, the coronavirus legislation, um, only uh, permits me to do extensions year by year um, and to be um, prudent and, and, and sensible you will throughout the course of that year want to be making you know an assessment of an assessment of uh, progress um, it would always be my desire then as is now to be making as much progress as possible but you want to see for yourself that, that the progress that has been made and to have and to have discussions. Okay. Thank you. Okay, we will have to move on. Okay. Um thank you for that. So if we can move on, our next item of business is to consider a motion to approve the affirmative SSI on which we've just taken oral evidence. So can I invite the Cabinet Secretary to move motion S six M 14590 in her name and make any brief additional comments that she would like to make. It moved, convener, and I don't have any additional comments. Okay, thank you. And can I ask any other members if they'd like to come in with any final points? Pauline McNeill. Uh, thank you. Um, first of all, I'd like to welcome the progress that has been uh, made, um, but I remain concerned about the extension of time limits. I'm also concerned about a number of things that are included in the same SSI that I might have considered the national jurisdiction differently, but I accept it has all to be in the one um, SSI. Um, I'm concerned about the lack of information around the use of fiscal fines. Um, it's been a long-standing concern of mine, went way back, <laughs> actually, um, to the use of fiscal fines, even to the last government, just because... Um, I think you've got to be clear about what range of offences they're used for, how well they're used. But we did note, I did note there's been a reduction in the use, which is quite interesting. But what I'd have liked to have known is, are sheriffs using 300, 400? What kind of tariff fines are they using them for? So in the absence of that, I, I can't really vote for the, the SSI. Again, I... I did have meetings with the Court and Tribunal Service prior to the pandemic and expressed my deep concern as you will recall, Cabinet Secretary, um, this Parliament took a lot of pride in the time limits that it established, which was unprecedented in the world. And we extended those time limits because we felt that they were far too tight. And now what's happened is they've been relaxed to such an extent as it's impacting on the prison population and the remand population in particular. And Chan Dow was quite right to make the point that, given the restrictions around what you can do with someone on remand while they're in prison, it just prolongs that for another year. Uh, we argued, myself and Katie Carr argued, that it could have been, albeit um, uh, more cumbersome, but a case-by-case -case basis would have been better. Uh, it was an alternative. And for these reasons, I can't vote for the SSI today. Um, Russell Finley. Thanks very much. Um, so the concerns that we expressed last year about the fiscal fines are specific to the increased level, but also more generally about the lack of information that is available to victims of these crimes. Um, the second issue is about the increased time limits, for, especially for prisoners on remand. G given that this is happening in the same year in which up to 500 prisoners have been released early due to the catastrophic overcrowding in prisons. Um, I've not really heard any evidence today from the government or any sense of urgency about what has happened in the past 12 months to remedy these problems in order that we don't need to have these 
additional 12-month extensions for both these issues, and therefore I cannot support the, this SSI today. Okay, thank, thank you. you. If no other member wants to come in, I'll just invite the Cabinet Secretary to wind up and press or withdraw the motion. Um, thank you very much, Convener. If I could just reiterate the point that addressing the backlog um, is actually one of the key factors to addressing the time that people spend um, on um, remand. Um, this is a provision for to extend time, li time limits for uh, one year uh, only. What I don't want to see is a, a premature lifting of these two remaining time limits. The other uh, five are, have either went or, or they're part of the um, expiry um, regulations. Um, I appreciate uh, Ms McNeill's long-standing concerns. It has, you know, for a long time now, been the case that our system can review um, a case on a case by case basis, but if we have to wholesale uh, reorientate the system to spending time on procedural matters, my concern is that reduces the throughput and has a direct mm -hmm. impact um, on the progress that we would hope to make over the next year in reducing those backlogs, because those backlogs are part of the contribution to reducing um, the remand population, to reducing the length of time in particular that people uh, spend, spend on uh, remand. And just to uh, also say that it's the um, Crown Office uh, and it's prosecutors and not sheriffs who make decisions in and around um, fiscal fines. Um, and I, I continue to uh, move the statutory instrument and, my, and the, both statutory instruments in my name, convener. Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. So the question is that with regard to motion 6SM14590, that the Criminal Justice Committee recommends that the coronavirus Recovery and Reform Scotland Act of 2022, Extension of Temporary Justice Measures Regulations of 2024, be approved. Are we all agreed? Yes. No. Okay, thank you. We're not agreed. So we will therefore move to a vote. So all those wishing to vote in favour of the motion, please raise your hands. Thank you. All those against the motion, please raise your hands. Thank you. We have no abstentions. So we have four votes in favour of the motion, four votes against the motion. So there's an equality of votes. Therefore, as convener, I will use my casting vote and vote for the motion. So the motion is therefore agreed. OK, thank you very much indeed. Where are we? Here we go. So the next question is whether members wish to make any recommendations in relation to the negative instruments, that is the Coronavirus Recovery and Reform Scotland Act of 2022, early expiry of provisions regulations of 2024. Otherwise, are we content that this comes into force? Happy. Thank you very much. And finally, are members content to delegate responsibility to myself and the clerks to approve a short factual report to the Parliament on the affirmative instrument? Members are content. Thank you very much. OK, this will be published shortly. So can I thank uh, you and thank the Cabinet Secretary and officials for attending this morning. And I'll suspend this meeting uh, for a few minutes just to allow a changeover of witnesses. Thank you very much. Thank you.
Okay, thank you, members. So our next item of business is to take evidence from two organisations as part of our ongoing pre-budget scrutiny. So we're joined today by Karen McCluskey, Chief Executive, and Keith Gardner, Specialist Advisor with Community Justice Scotland, and Lindsay Smith, Chair of Social Work Scotland Justice Standing Committee. So welcome to you all, and I refer members to papers four and five. And I intend to allow around 75 minutes for this session. So I wonder if I can start with uh, an opening question, fairly broad question to get the session started. And I'll maybe just work from my left and I'll bring in Lindsay and then Karen and Keith. So the question is, what do you see as the main financial challenges facing your organisation? And what would you see as the main things that need to be done within the budget context to address this? So I'll start with you, Lindsay. So um, one of the main financial challenges for, for justice social work um, probably sits with the, the whole system in relation to the, the prison population and um, the, the conversations and, I would say, opportunities to, to really try and shift um, the balance from prison to community mm -hmm. and, and, and the impact that that would have or should have on the financial envelope um, uh, for, for justice. Um, so I think that remains a challenge in how we do it as a whole system, how we shift the balance from investment in um, court systems, policing, um, prison, holding people in prison to community justice. Um, and, and I think that's a key challenge. Um, but I also think it's a key opportunity and it feels as if it's a, a, an opportunity now that we need to grasp hold of um, mm -hmm. and try and um, transform the justice system to ensure that we are dealing with people um, robustly, appropriately and well within the community. Mm -hmm. OK, Thank you. I'll come back with some supplementaries um, and I'll, I'll just move on to Karen and bring you in then. Okay, Thank good Karen. morning, members. Um, so there's a very famous phrase that says, don't tell me what's important to you, show me what your budget is and I'll show you what's important to you. Community justice gets around 2% of the overall justice budget. It is minuscule mm -hmm. in comparison to the complexity of the people that we are managing. Over three quarters of the sentences at the moment that are given out by the courts are short-term sentences. So these are people who are going into prison, revolving through. It's people who are in addiction, who are homeless. That is a very small amount of money, you know, in terms of trying to manage people into a life that's more predictable, understandable, manageable, to try and get them into employment. And it, it needs to shift. There is a... a there is a theory that says for significant change to happen, you need a compelling narrative. Well, I've, for the, I caught your last vestiges of your conversation. The compelling narrative is already made. We are at a really fragile state in the justice system and indeed in community justice. You need a zeitgeist. You need the, uh, the right time. And I think the time is absolutely now to try and shift that into the community and, and create the services that are required. And you need a compelling plan. You know, a shovel-ready plan that means that you can, you know, that you know what you want to do um, to try and address it and some, some targets so that I can come and convince you that we're moving in the right direction. So, yes, it is challenging. It's not going to get any easier. I think the fiscal um, envelope is tightening. I am, when Ms Reeves does a budget, I think everybody's going to be taking a deep breath. But this really matters. And it really matters not in terms of just justice, but drug deaths. I mm. think that probably the number of people who have died of overdoses and through drugs and alcohol, their contact with the justice system is significant. So we're dealing with the same problem. Mm -hmm. And we're spending it in different places. Mm. OK, thank you. Um, and Keith? Good morning. Um, I, I suppose I don't have a great deal to add to other than uh, people sometimes... The term community justice can seem a bit ethereal to people, but the, the reality, what can uh, community justice bring to the current landscape, particularly the issue uh, that's vexed us about prison population? But community justice has, has got the capacity to lessen the flow of people progressing into the system. It has got the capacity to people who are in the system to exit them as 
quickly and safely as possible and has got the capacity to um, keep people out of the system once they are finally finished with the system. So, uh, and I think there's a recognition that there will never be enough, enough money. Um, mm -hmm. But what we can do is look at where across the justice landscape that money gives the, the most effect um, mm -hmm. and where it can improve not just the lives of people, but the lives of communities as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. And just sticking with yourself, um, Keith Gardner, we, we know, for example, if I can sort of just focus in on work with young people. So there has been some movement, obviously, um, in and around keeping young people out of um, young offender institutions. Um, and certainly that there is a, a clear understanding um, that it, that is the right thing to do, but obviously that needs to be sort of underpinned with community justice approaches and interventions so that detention is essentially a last resort. I, I'm, I'm interested in, if, if we stick with young people and thinking about the budget side of things, if I'd be interested in a wee bit teasing out a bit more detail from you on the importance of that, but thinking about sort of smart budgeting, if you like, um, and I'll come back to Keith first of all, um, what more, if anything, do we need to do just to make that work so that young people don't come into the, the um, prison environment? I think, I think the, the, the strides that were made to uh, particularly get young people out, out of home mm -hmm. is, is to be applauded. It took us a wee while to get there, but we need to uh, celebrate our successes. Um, I think that the same, the same mentality applies whether young people are in, in uh, Pullman, young offenders institution, or in secure accommodation. The reality is all roads lead to Rome and they will be back in the community at some point. I think, I think that where, where it differs with young people is that it is a... a, a, a potentially bigger in, uh, uh, return if we invest more in services for young people uh, in, in the community. But people, uh, young people, when they, they, they reach either secure accommodation or 18 to 21-year-olds in, in, in the system, they, they don't appear out of nowhere. They have, they, by and large, they have a history, and we need to, to be conscious of the opportunities that there are further up the stream for young people, mm. when they do begin to come into conflict with, uh, with the law um, and how we intervene at that point. Mm. So I think there is a yield, um, certainly for 16, 17-year-olds, um, in terms of preventing them going into secure accommodation in the first place, which is it's not a simple decision for a young person to be in uh, a, a secure accommodation. Mm -hmm. It's a as an ex-chief social worker officer, that was one of my, my tasks, mm -hmm. was deciding that. But it's about looking at the opportunities to intervene with young people at an earlier stage. Mm -hmm. But the same goes for... Um, there's very, very little difference between a 17-year-old, 17 years and 11 months, and 18 years and one month. So I think there, is, there still needs to be a focus on 18 to 21-year-olds, particularly those who are committing the... the, the, the it's not a great phrase, but a phrase we have, prolific offending. Mm -hmm. um, I think we need to um, look at how we break that cycle. Yeah. Okay, we th thanks for that. If, if I can come to yourself, Karen McCluskey, mm -hmm. you spoke about, just in your opening remarks, you spoke about targets. Um, and you know, we, we all know what the, the value of targets and, and, and why we need to have them. I'm interested in a wee bit more detail on, should we be looking at different targets? Um, why should we be doing that? How do we make those targets meaningful? And again, thinking about a sort of budget context. Yeah, that's a great question. I think that sometimes we hit the target and miss the point around some of the targets. They're very, you know, whether you've been seen in seven days, whether you complete an order. So for colleagues in social work, I know that it's making somebody's life better and not worse. Mm -hmm. How do you look at the, you know, because Human beings are complicated and they need a great deal of work to move them to a different place. And I think we know how to measure. 
improvement journey is much better than we, we used to. But we don't we don't give this evidence to you know to, to committees like you because we just don't gather it mm. in a you know in a very rounded way. So I think we do need to have a, a look at just around all the services that the budget pays for and how that contributes to improving someone's life, getting them out of offending, hopefully getting them into employment. And I mean, what we have right now, the metrics are, are, are you know, are very simplistic. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Th 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 thank you for that. And, and just finally, um, Lindsay, um, in the um, joint so Social Work Scotland and COSLA submission, um, one of your key messages is around the community justice strategy and delivery plan, with particular reference to the new bail and release from. Uh, custody legislation and the significant implications that that has for resourcing across justice social work. I, I just wonder if you can maybe just add a wee bit more detail on what, what those implications are potentially going to look like. Uh, so um, so th 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 there's proposals around about increasing the number of bail assessments, mm -hmm. so um, ensuring that um, everybody's going through court um, where it's being assessed for bail, so instantly that that would increase um, demand on on the service that's not there. Um, so we would normally focus on those who are bail opposed um, rather than everyone. Um, it's, it would be a welcome development. Um, so there would be a, a resource and implication um, if that was to be be brought in. Mm -hmm. There is also other implications around about um, early release um, of prisoners and um, we would absolutely um, support that um, initiative in relation to getting people into the community early to ensure that we can work with them and support them to access all the key services um, and if the, the service is not there to support them, offer um, support um, to try and fill that, that gap. Mm -hmm. um, but again, if, if we are re releasing more people into the community requiring support, um, it does need investment. Now, that investment might not be just as social work delivering it, it might be the third sector, but whatever um, uh, you know, whatever way that the, the investment goes, it will require further investment. Mm -hmm. OK, thank you. OK, uh, thanks for that. I'm going to bring in um, members now, and I'll bring in Sharon Dowie, followed by Rona Mackay. Sharon. Thank you. And first question to uh, Carl McCluskey. Carl, you spent years trying to persuade the Scottish Government to introduce remote alcohol monitoring tags. <laughs> yes. <laughs> These are used to great effect elsewhere in the UK and have been proven to save money. Has there been any progress from the Scottish Government and what kind of financial savings could be achieved by RAM tags and other such measures? So this is my specialist subject, so you may have to stop me. So it's in the legislation just now. We can use it. We will now have to implement it. So there are, there are two technologies that are still waiting to be implemented. So one is GPS, which is a much more sophisticated way of, of managing people's movements within the environment. And the second is, is remote alcohol monitoring. So it's a tag that goes on your ankle, measures the ethanol in your sweat every 30 minutes and electronically transmits it. It's almost 100% accurate. I think it's very useful for people um, who have a, a course of conduct where alcohol has been involved in their offending. They normally put it on their ankle, they use it for 120 or 180 days, and you say, you know, you need to stop drinking, and I'm going to help you stop drinking. It's not for those who are addicted. It's not for those who are addicted. They have used it down south. I think it's, in, it's, it's, it's all over sort of England and Wales just now with some success. I think we could do it better. I think we've got some very good alcohol services in Scotland. I think that we could be using it within the court service. I have been you know, an advocate for it for, for a number of years. And it's, it's fair to say, and, and I think colleagues would know that I would say it, we've been slightly slower in, in implementing the technology. I still think it's got use. Around 80% of the crimes that we see in the court system is where alcohol is involved. You know, and it's not always those who are addi in addiction, but just, you know, the, the ones that are going out on a Thursday and Friday night. And so trying to get people to find their sober friends in their sober places and using the technology to support that, I think can be 
can be very advantageous, but it needs support. It's not just like putting a watch on your, you know, your, your wrist and then thinking everybody's going to take exercise. You need to be supported to do it. So like any electronic monitoring technology, it's not just about the technology, but it can be very efficacious. So have we made any progress? In so not yet. I mean, it's fair to say not yet, but it is in legislation. It took us a long time to get it into legislation. And then, of course, we had COVID in between. So in fairness um, to colleagues who are trying to bring this in, there has been a bit of a hiatus with, with COVID, but I'm still hopeful. Okay, thank you. And then go back, going back on to the submissions, um, all the way through it, we, we can see those things that the Scottish Government's National Strategy for Community Justice and Delivery Plan, there's the recently published Community Justice Performance Framework, but all the way throughout the submissions, there's um, reference to funding, significant implications for resourcing across GSW. It speaks about a depleted and tired workforce. Um, it then goes on to the Scottish Government's Vision for Justice, published in February 2022, includes a visual route map to a transformed justice system by the end of the parliamentary term in 2026. And it says, we will invest in a substantial expansion of community justice services, supporting diversion from prosecution, alternatives to remand and community sentencing. So it seems as if we've got a framework there that everybody's done a lot of work on mm -hmm. to tell us where we need to be. But it then also says, it's our view that the 23-24 spending priorities are not fully in line with the above commitment. So my question is, is change happening quick enough? Do you have the resources or are all these frameworks just words in a piece of paper that are never going to be achieved if we don't start putting focus on it? So things never happen too fast, they happen too slow. I think that's fair to Absolutely. say. Absolutely. There has been some success and I would go back to the, you asked about young people. I mean, that is a transformational change in Scotland. And it was achieved through early diversion, trying to get young people out of the system. I mean, a real brave, you know, focus on, we know that we have to do this, we know that we have to keep it To have zero young people in prison just now is the result of teachers keeping kids in school, it's through diversion, it's through real focus on it. We need to do the same with the adult population. But it does need some verbs in our sentence, as you say. It needs some doing words. Mm -hmm. and, and that will require resources. So I am a great advocate of some of the work that the third sector do. They are depleted. I sit on four or five boards of third sector. And they are scrimping about for money. You know, I mean, even if I talk about through care, so we are commissioning through care services just now. Um, the through care budget, that's for obviously meeting people coming out of prison and then trying to get them back into the, you know, into their homes and into their communities, was £3.7 million for 10 years. Never changed. It's now gone up. It's gone up to £5.3 million. If we were really trying to, to do this for everybody coming out, it'd probably cost us about £19 million. So there's a mind the gap in terms of what we can actually achieve. It is expensive, and I know people will be clutching their desk when I talk about money like this, but we either pay, pay now or we're going to pay later. And at the end of the day, this is about reducing victimisation. You can spend loads and loads of money on great victim services, and I absolutely think you should do that, but it will not create any fewer victims. You need to create, you need to spend money on, on services to stop people perpetrating crimes. And that's about addiction services where they're needed you know, in, in the courts and in problem-solving courts. It's around, around really facilitating some of the third sector who do work that statutory services can't do because they have a different relationship. <laughs> and it's going to cost some money. But we know what works. It's not as if we need to go and find the evidence base. The evidence base is there. It's whether we choose to follow it or are we going to try and build more prisons. So I think HMP Berman, which was the last big prison I think that was built in Wales, I think was something like £460 million to build. And then you're talking about £80,000 per year to keep someone in prison, you know, because of all the own costs. So it depends where you want to spend your money. 
I know where I'd spend my money. I know where it to better effect. And I know that community justice can deliver better outcomes than just cycling people in and out of prison, making them homeless, because that's what we do, and then try, then wondering why we're, you know, we're having people coming back out and they're getting a sleeping bag and they ended up on the street and then back in addiction again. I know, you know, I think, I don't know who it was that said, talked about the definition of insanity, but you know exactly what I'm talking about. To the criminal justice social it just oh, I'm, I'm going to just bring in other members and I will come back to you. I know this is a, an area of, of keen interest so I am going to move on and I'm going to bring in Rona Mackay and then Katie Thank Clark and I Thanks convener, good, good morning panel um, First of all can I say how much I value the work that you do um, against all odds it would, it would seem but um, it's absolutely crucial so I'm just curious to know um, the 2024-25 budget saw an increase of £14 million pounds in funding for nationally commissioned community justice services. Clearly, um, that's not enough. Is there, is there a way you can tell us how much your work has been sort of restricted by not having enough funding? And is there a kind of a ballpark figure you could, you know, a realistic figure, you would want to see your budget increased? It's, well, we'll start with Lindsay. Yeah. So, um, so one, what I would say is, is we would be making a strong argument to retain that investment that's already in the system um, and to have it mainstreamed into a, a recurring budget. So we, we received a, a, a 11 million of that. Um, and it, just probably to, um, to, to lean in on a bit of the, an answer on the, the previous question, the submission that Social Work Scotland um, submitted today it was a, a, a previous report from a, um, for last year with an overlay. So there has been progress um, and there has been investment into the area and we have seen some of our key services um, move on. For instance, our structured deferred sentence um, has risen by 8%. Um, our diversion from prosecution has raised um, over the past year by 28%. And um, we've seen an overall um, rise in bail supervision by 17%. So we're starting to see um, movement and some investment that came through last year. Um, we, we've, we've really focused on early intervention, so yeah. trying to divert people from the system um, in line with the priorities, in line with the incentivisation money that, that was given. So we have seen some success. We haven't seen a consistent um, success across the country. But to answer your question, I, I think one of the key areas that, that we need to do more work on, and I probably couldn't give you a financial value on it, is, is strengthening our community, further community um, sentences such as community payback orders and unpaid work. They, their areas, um, so we've seen a, a slight reduction in community payback orders, um, but there's, there's huge potential to um, strengthen them and improve them. Mm -hmm. um, one of our key challenges is um, judicial confidence. Mm -hmm. um, so we, we really do, I know judici the judiciary has grave concerns about um, just the whole system as a whole, so we, we don't um, exist within a vacuum. Um, uh, service users require drug and alcohol services, homeless services um, and mental health, and, and there's various parts of our, um, of our universal system that, that are creaking at the moment, mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. <clears throat> it's having an impact. So I, I, I couldn't put a... a I don't know. That's it. fine. That's really helpful. But, what, what what you've told us. Um, but there's about... more work needs done. Yes, yeah, sure. Yeah, Karen. I suppose it's where do you, where do you stop? Where do you yeah. I mean, so let me just talk about addiction services at the beginning. I mean, I, and I'm pretty pint because I, in fact, I, I went up to Edinburgh Sheriff Court with a colleague yesterday, and it, it could be like being in a waiting room of a, an addiction services because you. And I know that the harm that's caused, there are no excuses for crime, but there's loads of reasons. Mm -hmm. But we know that we're actually failing people within the system. They're not getting the treatment that they need. We don't have the stickability. Mm -hmm. um, Edinburgh and the Lothians don't have any drug treatment and testing orders just now because it's too expensive <coughs> and, and so we don't have any services at all for, for people who are coming in the justice system. Mm -hmm. That is replicated throughout the country to a greater or lesser degree. So there's absolutely money that needs to be, we need to be looking at those people who come into the system and, and costing that out. I think we can provide a cost. Can I give it to you right now? Sure. No, I can't. 
Mm. But in terms of the amount of people who are actually in the system, it is not that many. And I know that people get often overwhelmed by the volume of people who are in the justice system. They think it's huge. It's not. We've got a small amount of people who come in frequently. Mm -hmm. That's those who prolifically offend. And I think that the, the use of problem-solving courts, you know, with all the services in there and that stickability, providing swift, visible justice so that, so that it is... Apparent. I mean, that's why community justice, I think, really suffers in comparison to the prison, is we don't have a big building, we don't have a GOME van who, you know, who takes somebody. We're oh, sort of invisible, and we need to be better. I think we need to be better in making that more visible for sheriffs so that you could perhaps go and do your unpaid work on the day that you're actually sentenced, or you could get an electronic monitoring bracelet on the day you know, actually in the court, because I think that would increase judicial confidence. But in terms of the money, there has been work done elsewhere, actually in the UK, Greater Manchester did some work on how much they thought they would need in terms of, of, sort of what is their probation service, but, but just as social work. But it is a fundamental shift. Mm -hmm. It is a fundamental shift. Yeah. But if we aspire to be like some of the Scandinavian countries, and we talk about it all the time, regardless of who I'm speaking to, then we actually need to invest in that right place, and that means a big shift. It's not 2% of the budget. Yeah. OK, thank you. Keith? And, and I think it's a, it's a critical area, um, because when, when we think about more resources, we think about like workers at basically the coal phase and mm -hmm. numbers, et cetera, et cetera. There are other elements to this as well. For example, we know the yield that comes from structured deferred sentences. Mm -hmm. We know it makes a, 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 a... And the number of admonishments at the end of the deferred period um, is remarkable. But in order to do that, we need to schedule in court time. Mm -hmm. And we know that court time is absolutely a premium mm -hmm. uh, these days. Um, Lindsay and I were speaking to a colleague recently who would like to increase their, their, uh, their um, structured deferred sentence provision, but it's so sorely limited mm -hmm. simply because they can't get court time. Yeah. Um, and, and I understand the pressures on, 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 on court, mm -hmm. um, but that's one part of court business which could actually, if it was expanded, mm -hmm. would make a difference, a difference. Um, uh -huh. in yeah. processing SDS. Yeah. Can I just ask one more? Can, can I? Ask um, anybody who wants to answer basically um, what the impact of annual funding services is in terms of you having to make progressive plans. It really impacts on third sector. I mean, it impacts on justice services and, and statutory services, but it really impacts on third sector because yeah. come January, if they don't know whether they're going to get funded, they're already putting letters out to their staff saying, you might be out of a job. Now, I mean, that's a terrible thing to do, and I've, you know, I've sat on boards where, where that's happened. So you're losing really skilled staff, and particularly if I mention, you know, around women, you know, women who are offending just now. That's a really skilled role. We can't afford to lose, you know, lose people who are really skilled in that sector just now, and they're going to go into they're going to go into retail or other jobs where yeah. it's a bit more predictable. More so it really impacts. I think we've been quite lucky in terms of the through care. Um, Scottish Government have said that they'll, they'll fund for three years right. and perhaps longer, but we need that over and particularly around the third sector yeah. because otherwise we just can't depend. I mean, you know, our service is going to be there in the April mm -hmm. um, or not. And we've got 36% of women who are, on, who are on remand just now. Mm -hmm. If we had better services in the community, we could probably get a lot of those women back in the community with their children, because only one in 20 children mm -hmm. um, whose mum goes into jail stay in the family home. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah. Mean, I, I agree 100% with everything you've said, but, and you'll be aware too of the restrictions on the government, because we, we don't know what our budget's going to be. And I'm Absolutely. Not, I'm not using that as an excuse, but no. it's just a fact. So, um, But yeah, no, that's really useful. Anybody else want to comment, or has, has Karen said it all? No, no I, in relation to the... the uh, yes, yeah, so Karen has touched on the, the, the main points. I, I think um, it, there is a degree of uncertainty because you're, you're unable to yeah. provide um, permanent contracts, um, which, which does um, make uh, recruitment and retention a, a bit more difficult. Mm -hmm. um, 
I, I think where you do have more stable funding streams, you're able to um, think more longer term um, mm -hmm. about service development, innovation and retaining staff. So, but the other key bit is, is, is around about the flat cash nature of um, yeah. budgets and, and the challenges that that poses with, mm -hmm. with pay inflation. So, so yes, I think probably um, th there is challenges in the year. Um, what is can pointed out from a, a kind of local authority point of view, commissioning a third sector service, you, you can be six months end to end between entering into a process to um, procure a service and awarding a contract. So um, mm. you then might only have six months. Six months. Mm -hmm. yes. yeah. Okay, thank you. Thanks, okay, thank you very much. Um, Katie Clark, then Ben McPherson. Thank you. My office has put down a number of freedom of information requests relating to the implementation of some community-based disposals and also electronic monitoring. So, for example, the actual implementation of things like community service orders when they're um, ordered by the court, but also whether actually electronic monitoring actually happens and when the court orders it should happen. And it's quite shocking, some of the figures, you know, sometimes about half in half the cases in some parts of the country. They, there hasn't actually been implementation. And um, I'm not quite sure who would be best to answer this question. Maybe, Karen, I just wondered if you have any insight or you're able to provide any kind of thinking as to why that might be from your experience of the system. Well, Keith's been involved in electronic mm. monitoring, so he can probably give you a more mm. detailed response. I do think that RF technology, where you actually have to put the box in people's house, causes an additional sort of layer of complexity, mm -hmm. and, and you know, and, and so things like GPS, which obviously you know that I'm, it, it is, is easier to put on. But Keith probably mm -hmm. knows this in more detail. It, it, it's, a, it's a good question because um, the restriction movement uh, requirement within a community payback order. Um, which is a fairly new development, fairly ish new development. Um, there are parallel issues with that and electronic monitoring for bail, but I'll, I'll stick with the CPO thing just now. The, there hasn't been a great, up, a huge uptake in um, the, what they call the 10th requirement. Um, the, um, and I think there are a number of reasons um, for, for that. I think part of the reason is that the the management of the so I'm talking about the situation where the court has ordered that these um, measures take place and it doesn't happen. Uh, so situations where the court says there is to be electronic monitoring, um, obviously the the system of electronic monitoring that we have because we don't have GPS yet, but and it actually just doesn't happen. And this and again with community service orders that the you know, there's, there's an order by the court that there is a sentence and the sentence is never implemented, so the offender is never actually asked to carry out the sentence through no fault of their own. And I just wondered if you had an insight as to why that happens so often. There, there is a very, very thin uh, 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 issue in there, which is it's actually a restriction to movement requirement on a, a community payback order. Mm -hmm that actually, and, and the legislation doesn't say it's to be electronic. Mm -hmm. Logically, um, it, it, you know, that, that is the easiest way to monitor it. Um, and I, th I think that I would, if that, if, if to, somebody uh, has a condition, a requirement to be a, a monitor restriction of their the liberty um, as part of a, a CPO, I honestly can't fathom. I have no, no. evidence to say to, to you why that wouldn't be taken back to court unless the social worker was of a view that it wasn't um, practicable to do that and take it back to court and ask for that to be removed. I'll maybe provide the responses that I've had um, to my freedom of information request. They have been in the media, but I'll maybe provide them and, and if the witnesses were able to respond in writing afterwards, because yeah, genuinely absolutely. it would be helpful to understand why yeah. in such a high percentage of cases there hasn't been implementation. Um, I was wanting um, to um, pick up, I think, on the, the point that Rona Mackay was made about um, women, which I think you made very, very powerfully, and to get an understanding of the availability of alternatives to custody for women in particular and the geographical spread, because it is an issue that's been raised with us by sheriffs 
and others that in some parts of the country there are alternatives available, but partly maybe because there's less women offenders in many parts of the country, maybe more rural parts of the country, there just isn't alternatives available to sheriffs. Could, could you maybe say a little bit about that and maybe say where there's good provision uh, and where there isn't? So you're absolutely right. So we put together a community services tool because we wanted to show the services that were available. I'll send a link round and it outlines all the services that are available in community justice right the way around the country. So, you know, we're, we're just putting recovery services on our veterans <coughs> and for women. You're right, there is a geographical spread. So if you're in, in Glasgow or in Edinburgh or even in, you know, we've got Owls, who I think are in Fife or in Perth, there are some really fantastic women's services. But in other areas, and particularly, and members will, you know, obviously understand, we deal with some really complicated and vulnerable women in the system. And I'm not saying that they haven't caused harm, mm -hmm. but they are incredibly vulnerable and the services need to be really specific. And in rural areas, that's really difficult. And I think sometimes when they're coming in front of a sheriff, and in fact I've seen it, the sheriff is almost, you know, they're doing a Hobson's choice. What's the least bad thing I can do here? And I fear that some are going into prison because they think, well, you know, they'll get a warm place over their, their head, mm. you know, they'll get three meals a day, they might get some they might get some services, but as members have just been, been asking, on remand you don't get all the services that you need to try and recover. And lots of this is low-level crime. It's not like, you know, they're appearing at Sheriff and Jury and, and, and the High Court. They're in the summary courts. And... They're incredibly vulnerable, so it is, a, it is a real challenge. I don't have a good answer for you, but I can tell you where the services are. And it's certainly, you know, an honour service tool, which is now available on the judicial hub. So sheriffs can look at it. The defence agents can look at it as well, so that when they're, they're doing their plea and mitigation, that they can, they can say, well, there's a great service in Glasgow or Perth. And, and encourage um, sheriffs to perhaps consider more creative mm -hmm. um, sentencing. But... I yeah. And in terms of men, do you think there is more provision or is it again the case that in yeah. certain parts of the country there's better provision and others it's not as good? And could you perhaps give us a bit more on that about where maybe there is adequate provision or something approaching adequate offers so that sheriffs actually have alternatives available to them? And if there's parts of the country, maybe very large parts mm -hmm. of the country, where that's not available, is that something you could either say something about today or yep. share with the committee? So I can certainly send you some some information later on, but you're right. So I support um, colleagues out in Argyll and Butte, mm -hmm. which is a vast geographical area. So you can have, you know, you can have, you know, somebody who's offending an Isla, and you know there'll be no services or very very few services out there, and it'll be incredibly expensive. So the issue between women and men, I know we focus on women because we've had Angelini Commission and we've had a whole range of real focus on women. The issues for men are similar, but different, obviously. Um, if you're in a big urban area where you're able to commission services, then it's fine. So Glasgow, to some extent, Edinburgh, you know, it's Aberdeen, there's more availability. The further you get out, there is absolutely postcode justice. You will have a different outcome from where you would as if you were living in, in, in a, an urban environment. Mm -hmm. But even then, services are stretched. Mm -hmm. You know, there'll be waiting lists, it will be challenging. And it goes back to the... It goes back to money, I suppose, doesn't it? And availability. Mm -hmm. And it is much more difficult. We do do Highlands and Islands impact assessments. Mm -hmm. So through care is a really good one. We obviously have managed the through care. We have interviewed people in prison, tried to work out, tried to work out you know, how much money we need, but also thought about things like spot purchasing mm -hmm. for, for, for some of the islands areas where you can't have a standing army of people waiting for maybe one or two, you know, people who end up in the justice system, but you can spot purchase. Mm -hmm. So we've looked at, at some of that, but it is not, it's not a perfect solution. So you've spoken about the cost of a new prison. We mm -hmm. know that the prisons soak mm -hmm. up huge amounts of money. We do. Um, we know that the stated policy of the Scottish Government is for there to be a shift to custodial, um, non-custodial disposals. Um, there was an, a, a slight increase in the funding last year after years of there being mm -hmm. cuts or, or flat um, budgets. That might be partly due to the work of, of this committee. Um, to what extent, given that we've got this prisons crisis, do you think that new money is really having an impact and how much more would it require in the budget that's coming up that might make a difference that would actually have some kind of dent on prison numbers? 
if you want a community first approach, you're going to have to put more than £14 million pounds into it. £14 million, pounds, I mean, absolutely, but I mean, just with inflation, that probably just barely met the sort of inflationary costs. We've now got salaries that are, you know, that are under pressure, local authorities are under pressure. It's going to take something pretty seismic and structural to change the whole system. And, and to go for that community first. And, you know, I do talk about Scandinavia. You know, I, I think they have really good outcomes. They have lower offending. They have a, a much more moderate thought in terms of justice. They don't just want everybody to go to prison because some of the outcomes are pretty poor. But it's, you know, and again, I don't have the number, you know. But I do think it needs a plan. I mean, you actually need a plan. And then you need to cost it out. And then you need to find it within the budget. Because otherwise, we're going to be here for the next 10 years talking about some of the same issues. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. OK, um, Ben McPherson and then Pauline McNeil. Thank you. Just picking up on some of the themes that others have raised, I mean, just firstly, there's, there's the preventive spend considerations with regard to uh, prisons, uh, both the capital cost of building prisons and the operational costs of, of people being in prison. But I just wondered if you wanted to say a bit more about the preventative spend and um, almost social prescribing that community justice can can provide on savings in police time, NHS resource, local authority spend, because it's 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 wide benefit that that higher community justice oh, can absolutely. provide, isn't it? Absolutely. I mean, and it's how far you want to go back in terms of preventative spend. Do you want to go down to primary prevention, which we know has been evidence-based? And, you know, when James Heckman, the Nobel laureate economist, came to Scotland, he said, for every pound you spend not to three, supporting parents and supporting children, you'll have to spend about 15, 16 pounds by the time somebody gets to 15 or 16 to get the same effect. But then there's a the work that we do in the schools. And I am endlessly you know, just so proud of some of the work that people have done in schools, keeping kids in school, you know, trying to engage them, looking for their assets and not their deficits. Youth work, you know, in the community, you know, good youth work is as close as it gets to being magic without being magic, and we denude it at our peril. So in terms of preventative spend, someone asked me a question at the COSLA conference um, a couple of weeks ago about, you know, having a defined element of preventative spend like in a budget, saying that's how much we spend on prevention. The problem is that everybody does the narrative where they sell everything as prevention. So we have to be really clear about what, we, what we're trying to achieve. So is it keeping younger people out of the system? Absolutely, you can identify the preventative spend in there. Or is it, you know, whatever it is. But you, you just, I just sometimes think that if we just have a core part of the budget that's preventative spend, it'll just be plundered. Because everybody can say, well, that's prevention, you know. Smoother roads, not as many potholes, you know. So, so that, is, that is a bit of a challenge. But in terms of some of the preventative spend around the promise and around young people and around keeping families together, we know that the outcomes for children who end up in care you know, are sometimes really poor. And, and the fact that only something like 2% of young people end up in care, but almost are 25% and probably higher in the justice system, should tell us something that is not good about that trajectory. So spending more money on trying to keep families together, some of the work that Aberlour is doing, putting family support workers into you know, complex families where mum needs a bit more support, we need to get the kids out, is a great place to put your preventative spend. So th that's really helpful. So ad identifying the third sector and youth work services. I mean, I think of Circle Scotland that are headquartered in Pilton in my constituency, but serve all of the central belt. And I know some of the challenges that these organisations face, you know, to continue to be able to, to finance their important work. You know, I I is that a, an identifiable ask from what you've just said and what's been said earlier in the committee, that if the, if the third sector and youth work services could be identified for more more spending that would really make an impact absolutely i mean they are you know they i mean it's right back to christie it's around you know i, I think i think he said 40 percent of the spend that we do is on on preventable preventable um you know outcomes and so trying to get more spend in there and we have a really good third sector in scotland we are incredibly lucky that we have such dedicated and skilled people 
but we shouldn't be expecting them just to fund from year to year. And, and they, have, they will be picking up intelligence. So they'll not come to our services, but they'll know that in a community like Pilton, you know, they'll know that somebody's struggling and might be able to go in there and prevent them coming into the system. Because we are really expensive. Public sector is really expensive. Policing is really expensive. So trying to invest that bit early. But we need to decide we're going to do it. We can't just talk about it. Yep, absolutely. I don't know if others wanted to say anything on those points. I think, probably, I, I think um, yes, so pre prevention is, is critical. Um, but as Karen says, we, we need a plan around about how we're going to get on that journey to, to, to tip the balance more into that, um, that space. Um, and I'm, I'm talking a whole system um, tip of the balance. Um, I, I, I think there is really early... Um, you know, we're see, we've seen over the past couple of years since COVID some of the some real improvements from a community justice point of view, from a justice social work point of view, of early and effective intervention, you, increasing. So we've seen um, the advent of problem solving courts in Glasgow, where you have a, a youth court tackling some of the real um, challenging issues for young people who are who are you know are, are in the justice system, but we're really trying to get them out at that juncture. Your women's problem solving court, alcohol court. So th there, there is some prevention work, but it does need further investment um, to, to grow it and to realise um, the potential for that. And some local authorities where we, we've just been talking there about, um, you know, urban local authorities have the, the luxury of resources, capacity, um, sometimes a whole system approach. You know, if, you, if you're part of a your health and social care partnership, you're, you're working with um, a whole system to try and meet the needs of um, the citizens of, 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 of that um, local authority. But where I, what, but, but we, need, we need to be thinking, and I think this is where we need investment on other, the whole system for community justice and, and what that might look like. So understanding how we do meet the needs of women, for instance, who don't have a bespoke service as they do in Glasgow, for instance, but what is that one-stop shop ethos that has been proven to be really successful translate to Isla, where you have, you know, the challenges of delivering a service, but that someone can bring, you know, a, a, new, a new set of thinking in relation to um, meeting a variety of needs for that individual. So how how can a, a justice social work, for instance, play in other services successfully in, in a really rural area? So I, I think I think what we need to do is challenge ourselves and, and create space to think about how we could improve and strengthen community resources. I think we need to undertake a piece of work to better understand the challenges and we haven't had the space to do that, um, to really understand what the what the barriers and what the challenges are for local authorities who are not able to deliver on, you know, a, a kind of bespoke service. Um, but it's not to say that the outcomes at that bespoke service couldn't be um, couldn't be, you know, held elsewhere in the system in a different type model. But it, we do need space. We need investment to to realise some of the potential. Can I ask one more? Um, I just it, we, we spoke earlier about the benefits that the Children Care and Justice Scotland Act uh, 2024 has already mm -hmm. realised. Um, I sat on the Education Committee when that bill went through uh, stage two mm -hmm. and, uh, and and stage one as well. And one of the the strong pieces of evidence we heard at stage one was was from some of your colleagues at Social Work Scotland about just the, the challenge of. Um, resourcing the implementation of that bill. And I just wondered if there was anything, sorry, that act now, if there's anything more that you, you maybe wanted to say today about about where we are on that. So I, I can comment on that specifically, but, but what I would would comment on is again, is, is around about the, the investment in, in being able to intervene at an intense level early on is, is what we've proven. So, for instance, the, the youth court in Glasgow, which favours um, structured deferred sentences, so not imposing community payback orders, which are often, you know, really difficult to, to, to kind of fulfil the requirements. But if you if you get 
a cluster of services. You, you, you work alongside the court, you work mm -hmm. alongside key youth services. If we invest in, in, in a level of intensity at that point, then what we are seeing is young people diverting out the, the, the system. And as Keith has pointed out, we, we see people being admonished and um, entering into employment or future education. Um, it, it, you'll appreciate that's not the outcome for every young person going through this, but we, we have enough evidence um, to suggest that, that, that we do need a, a sticky outreach. We need um, services to be really well co coordinated and where we can co-locate. Um, so a lot of the success that we find is when we are able to pull together teams that include health colleagues, addiction colleagues, colleagues from a mental health background, so that we're not um, dealing with the added um, barrier of trying to access some universal services where we can deliver on that as a one-stop shop. Homelessness being key to all of that and supported um, accommodation for young people at that point are transitioning um, into living in their own, but also um, across the board. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Camilla. Pauline McNeill and then Fulton McGregor. Thank you very much. Good morning. Um, Lindsay, could I just um, continue when Ben Pearson got you to answer that last question about um, you said that there's a level of intensity required and pulling together of teams. So my question is, is that one of the key issues the, that it's expensive to have this intensity to pull teams together? And the reason I, I wanted to ask you that was because I remember when we first created the drugs courts and I assumed that anyone who had a drug addiction would go to the drugs court. But what I was told was no, we'll take, we'll choose those that we think are the probably, let's say, got the most difficult problems because of the cost of pulling these teams together because it's resource intensive. I mean, has it ever been better than it is now? I mean, or do you envisage that it's always going to be a problem because of the intensity of the resource required to achieve what like, we all do? So... Uh, they, are, they, they can often be mm -hmm. expensive. Um, the, part of the, the, the trick of using a finite resource is, is, is trying to, as you, as you pointed out there, um, route the, the folk who would require that level of intensity to the right place so that, so that you're matching the, the need and the risk to the, the right intervention. Um, I, I think, for instance, you mentioned the drug court. I think, you, you know, we're thinking creatively about how we strengthen community sentences and, and create efficiencies in the system. Um, that, that model, I think, would, would be something that we would want to review and think more about, you know, mm -hmm. that substance misuse issue. So do, do you expand that provision to, to look at alcohol dependency as well? So you're right that the drug court has tended to be um, held for those who have significant dependency issues um, when folk who are having um, not insignificant issues with, with drug mm -hmm. misuse um, are tended to be dealt with with universal services. So, so yes, there is in, in some um, services such as the drug court a, a degree of um, intensity and cost associated with it. Thank you. Um, Karen, could I ask you about... Um so you gave similarly strong evidence to the committee last time, I remember. So I went back to look at it. and um, But you did say to the committee um, that community-based disposals are a, a real issue because 80% of sheriffs would like to give those sentences, but they can't because one of the key issues being that drug services are at a specific time and or they simply lead to chaotic life. So sheriffs end up giving short-term sentences because they can't see a way around that. Do you think there is a way around um, this problem of sheriffs not able to have confidence that the current structure of community sentencing can work around those issues? So it's services being available and being, you know, and swift and visible. So not saying you have to wait 13 weeks to get an appointment, you know. I mean, they need it to happen there and then. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I do lots of the sheriff training. I find them very, very engaging and very mm -hmm. thoughtful about how they want to sentence. And they want to do smarter sentencing. 
and they are, you know, they're, they're bringing in procedural justice where they're saying to the person in front of them, what do you think you need? You know, not in terms of, you know, because most people are the best diagnostician of their own condition. They understand the services they need. And it's trying to get those services into the court and saying, look, there's somebody here in drugs or whatever else. If we've got 12,000 people generally in Scotland right now who are offending and, and drug users there, the issue, we really need to uptick the, the, the number of problem-solving courts you know, who, who are looking at things like the drug issue and getting that stickability. Because it's not just about one intervention for anybody who's tried to change their behaviour. Right. Relapse is a common part of it if you've tried to lose weight or stop smoking or whatever else. So you need to go back again and again, and it needs to be stickability. That does cost money. But I think we're almost, we almost separate it out, isn't it? You know, the drug death figures comes out, and they are terrible. And we wring our hands and we lament it. And yet the opportunities that we have to intervene, we miss. And I think if we thought about that more coherently, we got some of the sheriffs, we got some better problem-solving courts, we, you know, almost... I don't want to say hived off some of the drug budget to, to address some of those, you know, in, in the justice context. We'd probably get better outcomes. You know, and I think the evidence base from New York and from some of the places that the problem-solving courts are in place, we don't need to pilot it because it works. It's our ability to deliver it that's a challenge. Creating court time, you know, um, and just you know, getting the appropriate mm -hmm. sheriff to be able to sit. <coughs> but yes, I think. It but could what you'd said is that I mean, the sheriffs have a problem when they are looking at because if someone's a drug user, <coughs> then if a drug service is at a specific time. So I'm, I'm trying to establish, is there a way around that on a community sentence? Because if you can't fix that, but yeah. then we're just going to... It's going so, to be an ending cycle, isn't it? In terms of drug treatment and testing orders, in fact, I pulled this out for you. So, you know, obviously DTTOs are the way that we've looked at it. I have a slight rub with it because I think that, that addiction is a public health issue and yet we're trying to manage it within the system. So we only had 301 orders last year. Um, imposed on 264 individuals. If you take my last one, there's 12,000 people. And in terms of, I mean, that was one of the lowest numbers on record, and it will probably be even lower for this year. Um, in terms of a CPO where a drug and alcohol requirement has been in general decline over the past decade. So we only had 117 CPOs with a drug treatment requirement um, and 122 with an alcohol requirement. So you start to see the, the gap between the numbers who need support and treatment and the numbers who actually get it. And if we fail to address that, and sheriffs, I think they really, I mean, they see the same people again and again and again. And mm. I think sometimes they just get frustrated. But, but is it a drug treatment and testing order, does that get around the problem of not applying a community sentence? So do, you, do you mean that... Because a community sentence, in my understanding, is, is an alternative to prison. So you go and do something on a specific uh, length of time, but if you're a drug user, you can't do that because you've got to go and do something. Is, is applying a drug treatment and testing order to get round that? Technicalities. The, 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 you, you, you can. You can. Ships can and do, but they're... they're I think I think we should. The, the, correct me if I'm wrong. But at the back, of you, the, the the question in that is, how how do we make things available for people, whether they are a DTTO court or whether at the sentencing for a CP a, a CPO with a, a drug treatment requirement, is how do we then translate that into services there and then for people, the availability for for people to leave the court and to go into a service. Um, then, then there, there, there are gaps there. There are gaps there that people need to wait for services, their waiting times, and do addiction services prioritise people in the justice system? No. I'm, I'm not sure I understand, to be honest, um, the answer. So can I just read it again, in case I wasn't clear? Karen, you'd said 80% of people that sheriffs would like to give sentences, uh, community sentences, can't because, so they give them short-term sentences? Because the services aren't there. Is that, what you, is, that, is that the question? Well, what you said was that the, um, because, because, because the sheriffs would like to give them because they cannot be, to be a drug service at a specific time or simply because they lead chaotic lives. 
So I, I think that means that they can't complete the requirements for a community sentence. And so sheriffs then give a short-term prison sentence. Yeah, that, I think... that, that was my question that you'd said that last time and I thought, well, is there a way around that? Yeah, um, I mean, so is... the sheriffs then can say, well, I'm going to do this if I can get round the... Yeah, I mean, the difficulty with the DTTOs is that often you get breached because, you know, you're testing people and people are going to fail. And then sometimes when they get breached, you know, and they breach often, then people think, oh, well, I'll just... I'll send you into a, a short-term sentence. And, of course, we know that the evidence base behind that is that actually that doesn't work. Trying to mandate people, like, trying to punish them out of addiction or mandate them mm -hmm. out of addiction doesn't work. And so you do need other services. I think what I'm... I think what I'm picking up, and I might be misunderstanding the question, and we can pick this up offline because I've got some other data here mm -hmm. on, on what drug services are available around the country. So we need to combine the community service order that anybody yes. might get with community service orders for people who have got um, drug addiction issues yep. or alcohol addiction issues so that sheriffs can say, right, I'm confident that... I can apply community service or department prison sentence because I'm satisfied that within that we can work around the issues that you can get the drug services you yes. need. Is that, yeah. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> Got there in the end. Thank you. Um, Fulton McGregor and then I'll bring Sharon Downey back. Thanks, convener, and uh, good morning to the panel. Um, that probably is quite a, a good point for me to ask my first question, um, following on from Polly McNeil. Because I think that a lot of the discussion we've had today is where uh, community justice sits with other services. So you've been talking there about drug and alcohol services, um, which are very much in a health space. Um, but also there's been quite a lot, about, a lot of talk about children's services as well. So I wanted to ask you um, what your thoughts are, not on a policy angle as such, but more on the budgetary possibilities and uh, concerns around the proposals of the National Care Service. Now, obviously, at this point in time, eh, it's not proposed that um, justice services would go into the National Care Service, but there is there is proposals for something in the legislation that that could be brought in at a later date. And, I've, and this committee has made its views known on that, that we're not convinced. Eh, I've got my own views on that. But that aside, given what we've talked about with the interaction with other services, what budgetary possibilities do you think the creation of a National Care Service brings and what concerns as well. I know it's a very broad question, but I'm interested to hear. I, I think it's been a year since we've discussed this directly, where you, where you maybe are on that mm -hmm. at the moment. Lindsay? So, um, the, the detail around the National Care Service, um, for, for me, remains um, re remains not, not completely clear. Um, so, ju justice... Um, Justice has been considered about whether it would be included or not. So the, the general arguments around about justice social work being included would be that um, for it to sit separately would mean that it would be sitting out with potentially the universal services that the service users that justice work with are, are, are also working with. So um, your, your health, your mental health, your addiction services... Um, from a public protection point of view, um, which is, you know, is probably an area that we haven't touched upon today. Um, you know, uh, our work for in relation to MAPA, in relation to managing risk in the community, um, justice social work do that alongside um, children and families. You know, adult support and protection. So it's 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 built into a framework, um, a public protection framework. So, so the the. the to, to answer your question um, around about the, the, the financial implications, um, at, at the moment, um, Justice receive Justice Social Work receive ring, ring fence funding um, from Scottish Government to deliver on justice services, and, and um, across the, the view of the, the, the members across the country, from the Standing Committee point of view, is that that is critical in, in trying to protect um, key services deliver, delivering a, a justice response. Um, whether a national care service, um, I, I, certainly I know that COSLA's position is that ring fence funding would, would be something that they would want to see um, come to an end. Um, but I, I think it's a really good question, one that um, I, I, I don't know what the implications would be financially for justice social work um, 
and the National Care Service. What I would say is um, it's, it, it's taken quite a bit of resource trying to articulate a position and um, we've spent time trying to think of whether justice should be included in or out on it. Um, there, there is, you know, a, a, there's certainly a, a strength of feeling from the Justice Standing Committee is, is that we could have used that resource um, to, to be focusing on some of these issues um, at, at the point where we're at just now, where um, we're, we're, we're unclear of the, the future of National Care Service, albeit it, it appears to be um, continuing to go through the, the motions. Um, so I, I don't know if that's given you a coherent answer, but um, you, you'll forgive me, I'm vague on what, what the tangible impact might be and the financial implications. Well, I think the position is in Kuwait. You know, we still we don't know how much it's going to cost. I mean, I think that's obviously we're talking about budgets just now. I think when Philly was very was you know was very clear around health and social care, there's less detail around justice and children and families, uh, and and I think that that you know that is still the case. We have responded, but you know because we haven't seen the detail, it's very difficult to respond around what that's going to look like. The cohort of people who we support in the community do not tend to get, you know, lots of votes. You know, people don't really care about that group. I agree with Lindsay. I quite like bring fence funding because it, it sort of says this is a really, this is a group that needs, that needs mm -hmm. care, that needs support, that needs supervision because they've also caused harm. And I just wonder whether that, where that money would go, whether it would be diverted to other areas, if yeah. if we went in. So that so that, that would be a concern that you would have there with that. So that would that would be a concern because you know I heard somebody asking the other day there about you know the prisons etc. Was does anybody care? Because it's a, a group who are very othered, and yet are absolutely need, you know need services. And if we don't address them, they've all got kids and families. They are coming back into the community and need you know need to have their lives supported to change. So and, and you know, so I just haven't seen enough detail, and I know that Audit Scotland have obviously um, ha, have outlined the, their challenges around, you know, how much it's going to cost. Mm. Lindsay, you were wanting back in. Yeah, I, I wonder um, I, again, you know, with the lack of detail, I wonder if um, there is an opportunity um, for the National Care Service and in, in, in social care in, in prison, um, and you would you would hope that um, that by bringing together that the commissioning of, of um, health and social care within the prison environment, there would be opportunities to improve that and to have a more cohesive delivery of service. We, part of part of the the challenge is our aging prison population, um, the, the the some of the the complexities of the prison population, be it physical disability, physical needs, um, health needs. But, but one of the key areas of concern is obviously mental health and neurodiversity. So whether um, there is an opportunity there, but in the absence of detail, um, it's difficult to say that that, that, that could give us a, a really um, exciting opportunity to, to, to transform that aspect of justice. Keith, you were wondering. I think, I think it is, is a good question, and the, the well, no stand the, the lack of detail about the NCS. I think the premise behind it, the logic behind it, is that if you join more services under one umbrella, they get better access and better connection, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The the experience of integration joint boards across Scotland, there's roughly half of justice services that are in IGBs, and roughly half are out with IGBs. But all the areas report exactly the same issues that they have about access uh, uh, to health, access to alcohol services, access to drug services, psych psychiatric and mental health services. So uh, uh, you would, you, there would be an anticipation that within an integration joint board arrangement that there should be uh, uh, closer links. Um, but the reality is mm, not particularly. There's no evidence to say that it makes a difference to justice services whether in an IGB or out an IGB. Yeah, that, that's, that's really interesting. Uh, the next question I, ha I have is, is one probably directly for yourself, Lindsay, and, and, and it does come uh, from my own experience as a criminal justice social worker, so I'm going to tap mm -hmm. into that, although it's a, a while ago now, coming up for, for eight years ago um, since I last worked in that sector. But one of the things I did want to ask, is there anything that Social Work Scotland are thinking about or 
can make asks of the government or various other agencies about the particular workloads of um, criminal justice social workers. And, and what I mean by that is, I'm not, not giving away any, any secrets by saying that social work's very much moved to almost 70, 75 per cent paperwork at times. It's something that you'll hear mm -hmm. quite a lot. You know, there's the risk assessments to fill in when you're, um, when you're working with an individual. There's the reports to fill in. There's the various other assessments. Is there anything happening there that, that that could perhaps free up a bit more time and then therefore would have a sort of almost budgetary effect if you're getting more direct intervention? And I know the challenges there because I've done it. The challenges are real. Mm -hmm. and, and there's various different people wanting assessments for, for everything. Mm -hmm. um, but, but what's your thoughts on that? I, so, so you're, you're obviously right. Uh, um, that there is challenges in relation to... Um, carrying out risk assessments, carrying out paperwork. We, we, we balance with the need to um, the need to record keep and ensure that, that it's it's sound. Um, that there, there is I suppose the only way that you can balance that off is is, you know, to, to have a manageable caseload that you're able to, you know, record keep appropriately. Um, we, we, we do put um, a, a great stock on, you know, carrying out risk assessments um, for that risk assessment to inform, you know, our, our, our case management plan, risk management plan. Um, so that there is a balance. Um, I, you know, Karen's spoken about the use of the third sector, um, and you often find um, that that a successful management of a case often doesn't just involve the criminal justice social work what worker that it involves um you know a number of, of people who are, are working with that person to to meet their their, their needs um so so I, I think some of the the core functions of a criminal justice social work um worker are are probably hard to negotiate away but i think there is aspects in relation to stickability you know more specialist handheld type mentoring support that, that I, I think social work don't have the time to be spending two or three days with an individual per week. Um, so so there is a balance, but I, I do think there is a need, you know, to, to ensure that, you know, record keeping is, is given a, a priority, but it's, a, you know, we need to invest in, in you know, it, keeping caseloads manageable, that, that, that it's a proportion of the time that's spent on that and that people do have the time to, to undertake one-to-one -one intervention. Yeah. Thanks, Lindsay. Have I got time for another question? Or am I? Quick one. Uh, and then I'll bring in Sharon. If, if Sharon's, are you, you're okay? Okay. Um, okay, so uh, I don't know how quick it will be, convener, um, but it's because it's, it's kind of a general question. It's probably uh, for yourself, Karen and, and, and Keith. And that's just to say that, you know, I, I feel that I certainly don't need to be uh, convinced in the societal change that's needed to happen. But I do feel that even although you've spoke about this being an ideal opportune time, um, there just seems so much, so many barriers to it and so many things in, in the way. What what would you say to this committee and what would you say to the Scottish Government? What, what what would be the case that you would like us to make that, you know, to invest more in community justice services and that it's going to deliver those results that, that society will come, come with us? And how much time do you think that we need to see that change? Because it's not going to happen overnight. No. But what, what would be your sort of plea, almost? Well, if you don't need to be convinced around the challenges that we've got and the prison population, then I don't know what will convince us. Um, yes, you're right. I think we need... I mean, I've, you know, I've, I've sort of laid out that we need to tackle some of the prolific offending, we need to act smarter, we need a sort of strategic centre that sort of looks at the system, you know, so that we don't make decisions in one part of a system that affects the, the other parts of the system. You know, like, so more courts, great... But what you get is more outcome. You get more community sentences and more prison sentences. So it's, it's, there's a, a decision to be made about how we look at the system. It will need a probably five to ten year plan if you're going to really significantly just. But that doesn't say that doesn't mean to say that you can't get, you know, quicker 
results right now. I mean, at the moment, we've got people who are coming out of prison after being in short sentences or even have never had a sentence because they've spent their whole time on remand. I don't know how that's justice. I just don't. I don't think that people are getting the intervention they need. You know, we're depriving people of liberty um, without having you know a case or it comes to... It. So there is a compelling case already made. I do think it needs a plan. I think we will need to be, you know, we need to speak the uncomfortable truths amongst friends about how difficult it is to go and to change that, that direction. Because at the moment, prison seems an easy choice, doesn't it? Well, it seems an easy choice for us, you know, just to send people there. But it's not working. And we need to reserve prison for those who would do us serious harm. So those that are going to sheriff and jury and those that are going to the High Court are going to end up in prison because we need it to protect the rest of society. But for those that are churning through, it needs to be. We need to have a different, you know, a different thought process. And, and perhaps we need to have that philosophical thought experiment with ourselves around what success could look like and what Scotland could look like in the next 10 years if we start to make changes right now. Just very, very briefly, um, if, as Karen said, if... The, the compelling argument is the number eight and a half thousand towards eight and a half thousand in prison. There are some, um, there are parts here that we could tackle. For example, if we slow the flow that goes in through the courts, and that's you say, further things upstream, like diversion of prosecution, increasing diversion of prosecution requires a, a resource. At the other end, we have, uh, uh, and, and if, if, if people read the recent HMIPS uh, report on progression and risk management, you see that the progression system through uh, in the prison estate is problematic. Um, and whilst people are getting longer sentences, we need to really think about how we change the progression model going through and allowing people back into the community safely, always safely, but back into the community to um, spend part of their, 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 their rehabilitation in the community while still within the ambit of the custodial estate because to, to just simply try and keep like the, uh, and, and we, we support and welcome the early, the early release of, of, of the short term prisoners the reality is we fill those spaces very very quickly so if we slow the flow in terms of people coming into the, the system getting to court because once you're at court it's almost a, a, a lottery about where, where you end up but on the other side, for people, and it's 52-53% of the prison population are long-term prisoners, we need to find a different mechanism to allow those people back into the community so that we can support them longer-term rehabilitation. Thank you. Um, we're just about up to time, but I wonder if I can maybe just come in with a couple of quick final questions. And um, The first one picks up a wee bit on the question that Fulton uh, McGregor asked about sort of case management and that sort of time constraint around um, recording of information. Um, and I note that in the criminal, uh, sorry, the community justice um, submission, um, you suggest that the committee may wish to consider whether funding should be provided to facilitate or require more national multi-agency working arrangements in areas such as data and information sharing, which sort of comes back to recording of information, sharing it, being a bit smarter about how we work together. I'm just wondering if, if that's something that you would maybe just care to expand on, because I'm quite interested in how efficient that part of the system is. So it's not very efficient. No. Um, we have very old systems. I think I would, you know, I don't think we use AI in, in the way that we should use, you know, the, the other places like health use. Mm -hmm. AI is not used um, to great effect within the justice system. For a whole range of reasons, there are biases in terms of AI, but Fulton asked a question around, around um, you know, caseloads. I think there's new technology coming on, and certainly the probation service down south are looking at new AI to try and make that more efficient mm -hmm. so that people aren't double-keying lots mm -hmm, of information. Mm -hmm. But the bringing together of data sets 
my background was intelligence analysis. Mm -hmm. Bringing together data sets so that when, when you know, members are making a decision, you're stepping off from a very firm platform of data to say, right, well, we know what the case is, and, and, you know, and we're going to make this decision. Mm -hmm. That's not really in place just now. So police have systems that doesn't really talk to the appropriate fiscals, the you know, SCTS data, mm -hmm. and trying to merge it all. And we've been doing some work on people failing to appear at court just now, which is a huge issue. We have thousands and thousands and thousands of warrants for people who fail to appear court. Trying to work out why people are failing to appear, times and dates and locations so that you can actually do something about it, has probably taken me about six months mm -hmm. and probably longer. You know, we should be able to do that sort of stuff at the press of a button. We should have the data sets merged so that when it comes to criminal justice board or indeed coming to committee, I can give you decent information. You know, and intelligence, because it's not just about the information, it's about the intelligence, about how you can shape and change. That needs to happen more, and we are slightly, mm -hmm. I don't want to say in the 1990s, maybe even slightly further back, mm -hmm. in terms of trying to merge that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, colleagues down south, and colleagues may know if you've done counterterrorism work, we have a joint terrorist analysis centre mm -hmm. where that sort of information is brought together. Yeah. We, sort of, we do need that at, at Scotland level. There is only five and a half million of us. Yeah. It is not a huge amount. And yes, we have very old-fashioned systems, but you can still bring that data together that yeah. it can be meaningful and allow us to make better decisions. Yeah. Okay, th thank you for that. Final question, if I can come to, to Lindsay. We've spoken a, a lot about the prison population, and you'll probably recall that back in the summer we saw... 477 prisoners released early um, and the Scottish Government is also consulting on legislation to release some long-term prisoners early. So all of this presumably places uh, additional demands on um, justice, social work and other services. So I'm interested in whether the costs of that have been assessed, are they covered? What, what's, where are we with that? I'll come to Lindsay. Yes, yeah, so we, we, have, um, we have been doing modelling mm -hmm. a, alongside um, uh, officials um, to, to look at what the potential cost is, modelling on the, the, the predicted numbers that, that um, it could, could be coming out for each of the scenarios, so whether it, it, it be um, at, at two-thirds or whether it be a reduction from 50% to 40%. Mm -hmm. Um, so we have um, we have an, we have figures sitting that, with costs attached to them. Um, so we we do have um, we ha we have carried out that work. Um, and um, and I, I, again, you know, from from our point of view, it, it's something that we would be keen to become involved in. It, one aspect of if uh, you know um, the. The reduction from 50% to 40%, they, they are, those who would be released as part of that mm -hmm. wouldn't regularly have social work involvement, just as social work involvement. Um, and But we see that, that there is a real requirement there. Um, and at the moment, there's there's not that provision in place, although we, we, we there is a through care service, which um, has probably stepped into that space really successfully nationally. Um, but we're, we're, I think we're in, we're, we're in transition arrangements around about yes, that. But it's so so we have costed up um, what it would mean in the system at the moment. But um, a, a, again, we, we've also have been discussing what yeah, might sure. be missing in the system to to try and make that process more successful and make that reintegration back to yeah. the community more successful. Yeah, that, that that's really interesting. Very helpful. I'm, I mean. I, I don't know if there's some detail around that that you could perhaps share with the committee. Yep. That would be very we've, helpful. We've, we've done some work around through care about what that would impact mm. on through care because you have to meet people coming out. They need they need houses, they yeah. need connection to services. That needs to be modelled through. And, and of course, these are shifting sands for us just now. We've already modelled it. We need to remodel that and and look at how much that might cost. Mm. Okay, thank you. Final word to Keith or you? No, it, it just um, it would uh, it would also be interesting for the fifty down to forty. It would be interesting, I think, to the committee to see the the costings we've done roundabout potentially for the release at two thirds based on 
Um, mm. the, the scenarios are the risk people present and the cost that would be for local authorities to meet that. Yeah, yeah. thank you. That would be um, in interesting detail, helpful detail for the committee to see. So th thank you for that. OK, I'm going to bring the session to a close. Can I thank you all for um, your uh, attendance this morning? That's been very helpful and very interesting. Thank you. And we'll now move into private session. Thank you. <laughs>